right, good evening, everyone. I'm Sam Horton. I'm the engagement fellow with the Project for Unleaded. So um, we're in Missouri Independent and the Midwest Newsroom. And so I'll be moderating a little bit later here, but I want to first give a chance for Holly and Jason to get some opening comments. Thanks, Sam. Uh, thank you so much for coming, uh, everyone in the room. And then we also have about 20 people on Zoom from various parts of the region, maybe the world, who knows? Um, my name is Holly Edgel. I'm the managing editor of the Midwest Newsroom. That's Jason Hancock. He's the editor of the Missouri Independent. Um, uh, Missouri, sorry, the Midwest Newsroom is based at KCUR in Kansas City here. And uh, we are a four state collaboration of, of uh, public radio stations. So KCUR, we are in St. Louis, we're in Lincoln, Nebraska, and we're in Des Moines, Iowa. And our goal is really to provide in-depth uh, and investigative news coverage for those four states. So it's pretty exciting that we've been able to do this. In the course of our work, uh, we received a grant that um, was by the Kaufman Foundation that was um, earmarked for a collaboration with an organization outside of public media. Um, so we kind of were thinking who would be good to work with? Um, and we already, our stations in Missouri already have a relationship with the Missouri Independent. We publish their work, they publish our work. Um, Jason and Steve Akra already knew each other. And so we had a, I'll never forget it, a meeting in Columbia um, at the Uprise Bakery, and we thought this would be a cool partnership. We landed on this issue of lead because last fall, you may recall, there was a lot of coverage of um, these rates, high rates of lead in children around the country. And when we looked at that, we saw that particularly in our four state region, those rates were quite alarming. And so we wanted to sort of unpack that in a way. Um, what are the causes? What are some of the underlying problems? What are the historic and systemic issues at stake? Um, and we already had a few ideas to start with. And we thought instead of doing one big huge project that would come out in August, we would just start covering what we what we could do at this as we went. And as we went, a couple of things happened that made news. Um, one of which was the Missouri legislature passed and the governor signed a measure requiring all schools in Missouri to test their drinking water and their service pipes. So that's cool. Then just recently. Um, Kansas started the process of having people get their lead pipes checked um, because these are old, old pipes and there's a lot that can be happening um, underground that we don't see. So those two things happened along the way, but we've covered a whole range of issues. Um, we have some literature on your chair. Um, there's a QR code that will take you to a landing page at the Missouri Independent that has our stories there. And if you Google Midwest Newsroom, in case you are, you'll also find our landing page. Um, I'm going to introduce, well, we're going to introduce the moderators in a second, but I wanted to introduce Jason, who's going to say a few words. Very few words, don't worry. Um, first off, thank you all for being here. This is incredible. It's good. I like that everyone's going to, it's just like back in class, you're going to make the latecomers like trudge through to the front. Um, and thanks to the panel for being here as well. This is fantastic. But what I wanted to talk about was, you know, Holly mentioned last year, we kind of were tossing this idea around. You're going to meet Niara Savage and Samantha Horton in just a second. They're going to be moderating this. One person you won't meet here on stage, but you should meet is Allison Kite, who's sitting right there. She wants to wave to the crowd. Allison was writing stories last summer about high um, lead levels in children's blood in Missouri. It's a, astonishingly high uh, lead levels in children's blood in Missouri. Um, we'd written a couple stories about that, and then we started to realize that she was starting to pull string, as we say in the business, that this was an issue that was affecting Kansas, that was affecting Nebraska and Iowa. And we were trying to figure out why, and we were trying to figure out how we were gonna do this, because it was a, an ambitious piece of journalism to try to go to delve into this issue. Um, and we have a very small staff. Um, about the time that we were trying to lay out the skeleton of this, and Ali was trying to kind of come up with a, a way forward to really tell the stories when, as fate would have it, Steve and Holly uh, went to a ragtag cinema in Columbia, Missouri, if anybody's familiar, and had a delicious lunch and pitched me on the idea of a collaboration. And so it was, it was perfect timing. 
we had this thing that we were starting to work on. They had this like idea for collaboration and it really made the whole thing possible when we were able to bring on Sam and Niara to, to help us get it across the finish line. But I'd be remiss if I didn't at least uh, recognize Allison because she did an incredible amount of work setting this up and I don't know that we'd be able to do it without her. So hopefully we can give her a nice little round of applause. Yeah. I also wanted to give a shout out to um, the Midwest Newsroom team. These are your own, your very own journalists in the Midwest covering in-depth stuff. We've not only done lead, we've done housing issues, we've done development issues. We have a big story coming out, don't miss it, from Nebraska about corn detasseling. Does that ring a bell for anybody? That's going to be coming out um, from Nebraska, uh, Nebraska Public Media. So we're, we're, we're here. My card is near the front. We'd love to keep in touch. Story ideas, questions, whatever um, you have. I did want to give a shout out to my team who's here. Um, Steve Rockrot is our investigative editor. He's based here in Kansas City. Kayvon Monsuri in the back is based in St. Louis. He's our investigative reporter. Oh, Chris, Chris, Chris is doing um, doing audio tech in the back here. He's our senior content editor. He's in Columbia, Missouri. And on Zoom from Lincoln, Nebraska is uh, Daniel Wheaton, who's our data journalist. And so we have people here. We want to be working for the public in the Midwest. So uh, please take advantage of that. Again, my card is at the front if you have ideas. Um, part of this project was well, we got money to give journalists a job for seven months, and that's always nice. And the money came from the Kauffman Foundation, funneled through NPR, and through that we were able to hire Niara Savage and Sam Horton, or Samantha Horton. Um, along with Allie, and uh, we also got the assist from Jared Strong in Iowa on the story. They've just covered a whole bunch of different things, and um, I hope you can search up, search us out and find out some, some of that content. In, um, in addition to reporting, Sam has also been our lead on engagement. We did a couple of Twitter spaces. We've done a Facebook Live event. We went to a school expo in St. Louis a couple of weeks ago. Hey, take a lead testing kit, you guys. Don't put you on the spot or anything. Um, and so having the, the two NPR fellows, like Jason said, really rounded out. Um, it's rare to be able for a small newsroom, and, and we're a small newsroom, to just focus on one issue, one really important issue. It's not going to stop. We have some, um, their last day is tomorrow, believe it or not, but we have more content coming. So um, three more stories should be rolling out over the next few weeks. So be looking for that. And um, we are going to follow up with people we gave the testing kits to because we'd like to see what they, uh, and the officers out there, thank you. If you want a lead testing kit, feel free. Uh, we feel nice and safe. I also wanted to welcome Representative David Davis, if you just want to say hi. She's been uh, leading the charge on the lead pipes on the Kansas side, um, and she might have a few remarks for us about what she's up to there. So, um, oh, I think um, Senator Shoup from Missouri might be on Zoom. So if you're there, she is. <laughs> hi, Senator. <laughs> uh, so we're excited to, um, to have them here to take back information to their, their constituents. And last but not least, my boss, CJ Janaby, <laughs> just wait, <laughs> who brought the masks. Um, thank you very much. So um, Niara is gonna be going to grad school while well, she's already started back into her coursework. Sam is currently on the job market, but is looking like she might nail something soon. And so um, we're both, we're really excited to keep in touch with them as well. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce them so they can introduce the panel. Thanks, panel, for your patience. So good evening. I'm Niara Savage, and I've been the reporting fellow with the Midwest Newsroom and the Missouri Independent. And so it's been a really amazing opportunity to just be able to take a deep dive into lead and how that's impacting kids and families in the Midwest. And so I'll be moderating the first half of our conversation today. And I'd like to start by just going ahead and introducing our panelists. Dr. Elizabeth Friedman is a physician with the Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri, and director of the Pediatric Environmental Health Specialty Unit for Kansas, Missouri, Nebraska, and Iowa. Dr. 
Beto Martinez is a community organizer and executive director of Clean Air Now in Kansas City, Missouri. Amy Roberts is project manager of the sorry, project manager of the Childhood Lead Poisoning Prevention and Healthy Homes Program for the Kansas City, Missouri Health Department. And Dr. Ganga Hidiarachi is a professor of soil and environmental chemistry at Kansas State University and one of the world's leading scientists in the fields of soil, uh, in the fields of trace metal and nutrient chemistry in soils. And so to begin going down the road, could each of you just discuss how you're, in, uh, how you're addressing lead in your work? Thank you very much. And thanks again um, to um, Samantha and all the staff and, and your continued support. It's um, amazing um, how important and can be underestimated how important the media is um, in issues like lead poisoning in kids because our families are um, media driven much of the time. So um, they appreciate um, like um, media, um, attention to some of these details. So if we want our families to listen, one of the best ways to reach them is through the media. So um, in terms of lead poisoning prevention in my job, um, Kansas City, Missouri has had a lead poisoning prevention program since the early 90s. And um, in um, late 1990, like 96, 97, we added a home repair program um, to help supplement what we were asking families to do to keep their kids safe. So we were going into people's houses, doing inspections, recommending families make changes in their home. Um, and so when the opportunity came to get some money from the US Housing and Urban Development um, Department, we really wanted to get our hands on some of that so that we could help families do what they need to do to, to improve the health of their kids. So we've been doing that since, again, the early 1990s. And now we have a home repair program, investigations, and a lot of components to sort of um, treat lead poisoning as a, as a global issue um, for our families and for our jurisdiction. Hello. Um, yeah, um, as Amy said, uh, thank you so, uh, so much for organizing this. And then the, um, as Amy mentioned before, the, the media has huge responsibility when it comes to environmental issues and um, the actually getting the scientific information to general public. I think we cannot underestimate how much, uh, how important the media involvement in getting that. What we do won't be translating well or going into general public if we don't have responsible media. So the um, so having said that, so what my involvement with uh, lead issue? So I'm a, a, a as mentioned earlier, I'm a soil and environmental chemistry researcher at Kansas State University. So in addition to doing uh, teaching, I do research, and um, I have been working on uh, in situ stabilization of soil lead uh, during my PhD and after my PhD. So as a, as a uh, researcher at K-State. So the, uh, the importance of it is we do know that the uh, lead is widespread uh, environmental contaminant in soil and almost all urban soils you could consider when you look at background lead concentrations in soils elevated so that the urban soil background is much higher than what we consider as normal soils, uncontaminated soils. So, so that problem, this mild elevation is everywhere. So, the, so it is uh, really not practical to think that we can excavate, we can hold all contaminated soils and fill up with clean soils. Where would this uh, uh, big soil go? And where would we find clean soil to replace that? So that's not a practical solution. Though that's why institutes uh, stabilization comes into uh, like can play an important role. So institute stabilization is using soil knowledge to 
reduce bioavailability of soil lead in place uh, and then have really incorporate these into existing the, the lead mitigation strategies the citywide and nationwide we have as like Amy, the program that Amy is doing and then also the program that Dr. Friedman is working on and every other is working on. So I think my involvement is, uh, my passion is actually use soil knowledge to minimize the risk of lead, even if it is accidentally ingested. Please say the question once more. Um, yeah, just go ahead and tell us about how you're addressing mining right now. Okay. Um, so I do wear a few different hats. Um, but most of them encompass clinical care, whether it's public health or individual patient care. Um, one of my responsibilities is to educate other clinicians from public healthers to physicians um, on sources of lead, screening for exposure, managing exposure, and preventing exposure, um, and all of the things that go with that, whether it's um, collaborating or advocating and supporting um, the poison control centers in our region um, and looking for chelation therapy, which there's a national shortage of, um, or it's supporting groups like Amy's and the Healthy Homes Program at Children's Mercy. Um, and through that program, we also provide services to supporting services to groups like Amy's and also the state of Kansas, which is still working on building up their program. Um, I think I'll stop there. Yeah, hi. So um, one way we address, uh, we look at it from the lens of environmental injustice. Um, a lot of our communities of color are impacted by that. And not just the communities of color or fence line to industry, right? Um, a lot of communities that doesn't have to be a low income community, right? That's been impacted. But really our work is really focused in those communities because we know that the impacts are not just from lead. There's multiple sources of pollution, the cumulative impacts, right? They're not just exposed to lead in the soil, in the water, in the air. They're exposed to other uh, toxicants um, also in their neighborhood. So we address it through that and also through that lens of environmental justice, but also um, looking at the agencies that are tasked to protect public health and one of them, for example, is the Environmental Protection Agency, which could be doing more, right, to do their job and do it right. Um, however, you know, they cite with the industry most of the time. So it's really difficult to really address these issues when it comes to when there's regulation, but the agencies that are tasked to protect our health are not doing their job. So that's the kind of work that we do, making sure that enforcement is happening at all levels of the government, local, um, state and federal. And so Elizabeth, last year, the Centers for Disease Control lowered their blood lead reference value for children. And so could you tell us a little bit about what that number is and what parents and caregivers need to know? Okay. Um, so the CDC changed their reference level or their, their action level from five micrograms per deciliter measured in blood to 3.5. Um, the numbers aren't as important as the concept, which is um, that they are guiding clinicians to and, and public health programs and state programs. And we have um, some of our state partners also zoomed in um, to take action at when we have detected a child with blood lead level of 3.5 micrograms per deciliter. Um, but that's the summary. <laughs> I could go on with more detail, but I think I'll stop. Thank you. Unless Amy has something else to add, since, since she's involved in the population response. Um, sure. Thank you. Um, so um, 
it's great that we are able to collaborate. The, the, I mean, I, I know I've spoken with everybody and worked with almost all of the people at the panel, which is awesome. And that's part of our work is working together. Um, and so CDC, as part of working with all the groups, um, as they gradually lower that level, we know already that there is no safe level of lead, right? So we want kids' test results and adults' test results to be zero. Because we already know that you can have problems with reading and math scores in children with levels as low as two, right? And so CDC is gradually um, proceeding to lower the action level um, kind of as they work with the different agencies, as they work with the labs to make sure that labs can get accurate results, as they work with agencies to make sure that agencies have the resources that they need to be able to um, help families, you know, um, as they develop messaging so that we can, um, so that they can be um, consistent and um, do a good job of explaining why these levels are slowly going down. I mean, we, we know lead is toxic. Um, we've known that for a long time and we know what the level needs to be. And this is part of that process to, um, to get us where we need to be. And so this next question is for you, Amy, and it's kind of a follow-up to that. Um, so how does the health department in Kansas City go about investigating cases of elevated blood lead levels in children? And has that workload increased since the CDC lowered the reference level? Thanks. So um, in Kansas City and also, well, in Missouri and Kansas, um, lead test results are reportable, just like it was an infectious disease, similar to that. So when lead tests are done, those results are sent to the state. So the state can keep track of them and see how kids and adults are being exposed and make decisions about, again, resources and um, what the state needs to keep everyone healthy, right? So um, in Kansas City, when we get, we get reports from providers, um, from parents and from um, labs and from the state and the reports whether they're a call or an email or whatever, they come to our health department. Um, and this works similarly in other areas also. Um, and then for us, we do investigations for lead poisoning kids. So we um, call families who have lead poisoning kids and go out to their house to find out how they've gotten lead poisoned, right? We do that for adults too. Um, there's varying degrees across Kansas and Missouri of uh, resources that public health has to be able to help people. So um, investigations um, are where the kids get assigned a nurse and a nurse and an inspector go out, do inspections to the families. Um, we do education, we do testing in the home, um, and um, we also can offer uh, free home repair to families who are interested. Sometimes those investigations expand out of the residence, so out of the house, and they may go to the daycare or a relative's house or um, a store where they purchase something or a restaurant, you know, it's, um, I was trying to make a note here and I was kind of like, what we do um, as part of environmental and working with the public and the public's health is it's a little bit CSI, it's a little bit Aaron Brockovich and it's a little bit, um, what's the other one? Oh, Grey's Anatomy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's kind of a little bit of all that and, and that's why we all have to work together um, as, as part of this. So again, the resources may vary a little bit throughout the two states or throughout a region. I guess I should be speaking on a regional level, right? Um, so um, the, the basic resources are the same and the basic desires for what we want to do are the same. Does that help? Yeah, yeah thank you. So Ganga, you've been researching um, ways to reduce bioavailability of the lead in soil. Can you tell us a little bit about what bioavailability is and also talk about how lead gets into soil and how it poses a threat to human health in that way? Yeah, so the starting with um, how uh, lead gets into soil. So the uh, you can find any naturally occurring element in soil, but not in very high quantities. So you can find lead in soils naturally occurring. And then the, if you look at what's the background or average lead concentrations in uncontaminated soils worldwide, it depends on which source you look at. The, it could range from 15 to about 35 ppm parts per million or milligrams per kilogram. 
And then uh, the looking at urban soils and looking at what's the urban soil background, the mean, it depends on where you look at. And it could range from all the way from 150 to about 250. So the so the how uh, we get elevated soil land, like more elevated than uh, these what we considered as uh, background, and then why in urban soils it's higher. That is due to multiple reasons. One reason is use of leaded gasoline uh, before banning it, and then that actually uh, uh, led to widespread. Uh, lead contamination. And then before 1978, before banning uh, the leaded paint, so the leaded paint is, so the house was built before 1978, so you could see that lead. And then that peeling lead and then after demolishing or just all, uh, being there, so you could see that the, the lead get in, uh, uh, enter soil and then stay there. Lead is going to be persistent. Lead form can change from one form to another, but it's not going to be degraded. Lead is not moving easily, so it could be just accumulated at the soil surface. So, uh, so those are two main ways, and then not to mention the mining and other related activities. So we can look at, we don't need to go that far. We can look at tri-state mining region, where we had the lead sink mining for nearly 100 years. And so we do have this legacy lead contamination, not only lead, but sink and cadmium contamination in those areas. So those are the uh, sources, main sources of lead. And then there are multiple other sources that probably maybe can mention when doing home investigations that you find. Uh, and then the bioavailability. So I know that most of the environmental regulations based on total concentration in any medium. So soil is a, like the environmental medium. So when the EPA or any other regulatory body is looking at enforcing uh, any kind of regulations, then they look at total lead concentration. So for example, the quite old, I mean, right now probably uh, EPA considering uh, like evaluating the change that is the children play area standard that is 400 parts per million for ppm and then if you look at Missouri like soils we have 260 ppm for residential soils so likewise you can see you can look at uh, uh, European community you can look at different uh, states regulations what are the limits likewise but really what's important is bioavailability, bioavailability, not the total concentration. Bioavailability means like simply, what's the fraction of total lead available for organism to absorb? So that's the amount that's going to cause issue if someone accidentally ingests the contaminated soil. So I, I think uh, that's it related to bioavailability and I think I answered that was a great answer. I just wanted to add because we're in KCK, Mirror is super fun site. Um, feel like it's there's value in giving the real life examples. So Argentine um, was the location of a silver smelter. Argentum is Latin, no, Latin. Latin for silver. So, um, so you know, we talked about mining and extraction, and then that stuff has to be processed. The silver was pulled out, and all that waste was kind of left. And so that's one of the that's a, that's another source. And it's also a very um, appropriate local source discussion. And then we also that's it. Go ahead. Yeah, so I yeah, just want to add a little bit about that, the history, right, the local history of uh, Argentine, the smelter, and the numerous Superfund sites that exist here in, in Kansas, Kansas City, right, uh, where, I mean, there's been cleanups, right, but not to the satisfactory levels of, of a community, right, I think a lot of 
there's a lot of political moves that continue to put those the burden the, on the communities of color. And so we really need to think about, you know, the, the historical issues, you know, it's in the past, but how do we move forward in addressing it in a way that it brings a brings uh, direct benefit to the community, right, as a whole, because you know, um, the Argentine is a, a very good example of how political people appointees can capitalize on a project. And, and I want to share this because it's important to think about the impacts it can have on a community of color, like in Argentine, for example, since, you know, if this plot of land was available, they gave it to a nonprofit, the nonprofit, you know, had a, put, a lot of pressure was put on them. Hey, what are you going to do to clean this up? However, the EPA moved forward with some political appoint, appointee and a local appointee to say, hey, you're not going to be able to do this cleanup. It's going to cost a lot, of a lot of money. However, they had already made agreements with the Walmart, <laughs> the Walton Foundation, to build a Walmart, right? And the people that continue to go to this store this are people of color, the, the, the majority, right? And so I want to share that because and the work that we do in our organization started in Argentina and Armourdale, right? And these are the impacts of the people living there and not just the impacts from, from the legacy contamination from the smelter, but also living in close proximity to recycling um, uh, scrap auto dismantlers that also emit toxic lead into the air, right? And so it's not just looking at thinking, we always think about water and, and a lot of people think about the water pipes and the paint, but we have a cooperator in all neighborhoods, right? And I think we can get into that a little bit later around like even the dollar stores, right? The impact that there's a lot of products that they sell there that the same communities are going in there and buying toys for their kids at a, reason, a cheap price, but not knowing the dangers that they're exposing their kids to. And I just wanna add that, um, you know, the EPA, um, you know, we work collaboratively with EPA. We do hold them accountable, but we do work with them collaboratively and trying to identify um, what solutions there are or a work plan, right? To get some, uh, to make some progress and really look at it from uh, the environmental justice lens, right? Making sure there is some benefit to those communities. So we do work uh, closely with them. We do hold them accountable, but we do work closely with them. I know there's a couple EPA people in the audience. So um, just wanted to, highlight that, that work, working relationship. Thank you. Thank you. That was kind of actually uh, the perfect segue to the next question that I have uh, for you. So as you mentioned, you know, a lot of times we think about the sources of lead being lead pipes and lead paint, but there are other sources of lead, including in consumer goods uh, like spices. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how people are exposed through those routes. Yeah, so, you know, I have colleagues that have done a lot of extensive research on the 99 cent store specifically because a lot of these stores, I mean, they're everywhere, right? But there's a high, there, the majority of them are also in low income neighborhoods. And so, or in strip malls, right? When you can go for a 5.99 pizza and a soda and then go to the dollar store, and you have, you know, your full meal, right? For, for the evening for a family. Um, and so what they found is that, you know, we've even found it ourselves in testing some of the material there. We tested some plates. People were eating off these plates at an event and we tested it with an XRF gun. And when we tested them, we noticed high levels of lead in that product. And it's like, this is an environmental conference, right? Like, what are the odds, right, of this happening? But, you know, we had to call out the, the restaurant and say, hey, you need to really look at that, you know, make sure that you provide you know, she, you don't utilize, and they told us they bought them at the dollar store. So that's how we knew we made that connection. But yeah, there's been a lot of uh, research uh, looking at, you know, spices, also looking at candy, at, at children's uh, toys, so they put in their mouth. We also know it exists in, uh, in uh, um, lipsticks and, and makeup as well. So there's a lot of these other things that we don't think about, you know, and a lot of these are the ones that are more easily accessible or at a lower price where people think, well, I'm going to use this. And guess what? If the parent buys it, you know, a lot of kids do play with the parents' makeup, you know, and then they, they put it in their lips or whatever. They ingest this stuff. So there's multimedia ways of ingesting uh, lead. But I think that that there is, there is still a lot of um, 
um, more education on that. Like, how do we prevent that? Because you know there is a process when things come from overseas to our country that there is a, a California Air Resources Board, for example, in the in the West Coast and the ports can actually stop those products to getting into knowing that they're not uh, they don't they don't have the, the proper um, uh, FDA approval, right? So. Uh, there's those ways to kind of like leave those things off the mark, uh, off the stores, so off the shelves. But I think that the other issue is really is, you know, I know the EPA put out a, a listening session last year. And I think, you know, the listening session is good and that just to hear from community members. But I think there's an opportunity to do more, right? We know we have a old dilapidated infrastructure, right? That we need to invest in as well. And so really thinking about, also thinking about the Justice 40 uh, money, right? It's gonna be made available. And we are positioned to really work with our decision makers to make sure those investments do make it to those communities because this is an opportunity that we have, right? We don't have it always. And you know, in our work, we don't wait for the funding. It doesn't matter, right? We do this work with or without funding. But I think this is an opportunity for our decision makers, our elected officials, um, to really look at that and look at the investment from a different perspective, right? If, even if it's infrastructure money, not thinking that it's just to build roads and bridges, but really um, investing in the communities of color that are most impacted, right? And so, um, yeah, so we, we look at it holistically and wanna make sure that we look at the thing, these investments and really willing to, uh, ready to work with our Congresswoman here today, you know, Sharice Davis and identify those opportunities because really that, that investment is really going to be driven from the ground up, you know, and so this is an opportunity that we have to change some of those, the, the way things are. And so as a follow-up to that, do you believe that the government does enough in terms of regulations for protecting consumers from uh, potential lead and goods? And should consumers feel comfortable trusting and relying on those regulations to keep them safe? Well, I think that, you know, like I said, you know, if you bring stuff from overseas, there's a way to stop if you know something's not, you know, it's not FDA approved, right? So there is a way for the government to do their job the right way, right? And not just look the other way. And I think that's important to always highlight because, you know, we are at a time in our country where, you know, it's not just the lead, right? It's a global climate crisis, right? And the lead is one of them, right? Lead is one issue that everybody talks about, but for some reason, it's not getting addressed as, as we should. And we know there's money even at the federal level right now for lead uh, remediation, lead pipes and new infrastructure. So I think that, there has to be there, yeah, there needs to be more from our, our regulators, but even our local state departments like KDHG and Department of Natural Resources, right? Because they are they 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 can do more. So So thank you so much. At this time, I'm going to go ahead and um, invite our Representative David to make some remarks, and then I'll pass things off to Sam to finish the rest of our conversation. <laughs> okay, good evening. I'll try to stand. How's this? Well, thank you all so much for your um for your discussion i do have questions but i'll maybe save them for the or i'll i'll throw them out at the end and then go sit down um but uh i appreciate having uh just a moment to say hi i'm uh, uh rep Sharice davids i represent the kansas third congressional district which uh currently is all of wyandotte all of johnson and a small portion of miami county um and then in the next session of Congress, the third district will be a, a, a smaller portion of Wyandotte County, all of Johnson County, Franklin County, Anderson County, and all of Miami County. And so, um, yeah, I have been in this role for just uh, a few years now, uh, feels like 10, uh, just a few years now, and um, have really gotten the chance to learn a lot about uh, why addressing, um, especially lead, but a number of other 
uh, factors uh, when it comes to kind of social determinants of health and the way that uh, certain communities have. Um, and I think we see that uh, particularly here in Wyandotte County, uh, whether it's industrialization, processing, um, or other, uh, other, you know, not just in the soil, but in the air and the water, uh, other things that we need to be doing from the federal level uh, to uh, address those things. And, you know, most recently we, uh, we were able to get um, some funding available for lead, uh, lead, lead pipes um, replacement um, and also taking of inventory because that's one of the things that I think um, a lot of communities just don't even have the resources to actually take inventory so that the pipes can then be replaced. Um, but I am so glad that, uh, that the Midwest Newsroom is uh, covering this topic because um, knowing that zero is the amount of, uh, of lead that should ever be in ingested um, uh, is, uh, shows us just how much work we have left to do. Um, and definitely appreciate the, uh, the efforts that you all are making. I'm gonna throw out my two questions as I I have one for you. Oh, okay. You asked me your question. I'm not trying to take over the thing. <laughs> no, so um, this has come up in multiple conversations recently at um, the Heartland Environmental Justice Work Group as well. And um, you mentioned a large amount of funding coming into your district um, regarding lead pipe replacement. And while water is not the largest by any means medium through which children and anyone is exposed to lead in this part of the country. Um, I'm wondering if, um, regardless of whether it's under your control, if, if, if leadership is talking about ways to prioritize the communities that are most affected by lead exposure as they make these investments in lead pipe replacement. And, and ideally that would be implied, you know, like, uh, Bezo said, in a lot of our investments locally, mm -hmm. um, so that the funding actually goes to serve those who are going to benefit the most, who are the most overburdened already. Um, and since you brought up the pipe, I thought I would yeah. ask. Yeah, that. so um, a couple of things that I think are really important about, uh, especially the most recent funding yeah, that's coming out of the bipartisan infrastructure bill, which is where this funding is coming from. Um, is that uh, I think in years past or you know historically, uh, the federal government has um, not until very, very recently uh, included metrics and that sort of thing that would um, that would take into account uh, historic uh, disproportional, you know uh, disproportionately negative, um, impacts, but um, in the bipartisan infrastructure bill, there um, there were provisions that address that. So uh, just recently, I was out in Olathe and visited with the team um, that's doing their lead pipes program. And uh, in Olathe, there are only certain census tracts that are actually eligible for the program funding. Um, and then uh, for Wyandotte County, actually the entire county would uh, fall into the category of, um, uh, into the category and of uh, eligibility for the funding. Um, and then just so everybody knows the, so the federal government puts those parameters there, uh, but at the end of the day, uh, the money does go uh, to the states and various counties. And so um, it would be, uh, what I consider, I try to be a good federal partner is what I always say. And so being able to um, uh, get a full picture of why it's necessary to make sure that uh, communities that have been disproportionately impacted historically, uh, why it's important to make sure that those specific census tracts or communities or counties um, are eligible for, for that kind of funding. Um, yeah, but that's a great question. Thanks for asking. Um, I just wanted to ask, I have two quick questions and then I'm gonna hand this over. Um, okay. Oh, okay, that's great, thank you, that makes sense. Um, okay, the first question I had, and this is, I almost feel silly asking this, is how would lead poisoning be 
found do like is it a kid gets sick and then they like they present at the hospital with some kind of thing or is that is there just like kind of testing going on um standard and randomly and uh i'm asking as someone who has uh, some nieces who are uh you know they're little babies now but i just to as a curiosity and then the second thing um which is uh probably uh Beto, maybe you will be able to help is um, learning about the different types of goods that are being imported, imported because I think that the um, uh, US manufactured, particularly food products, but other products I imagine go through a different set of um, review process than goods that we're importing. Im I don't know why I'm saying it so weird, I'm sorry. Importing, but uh, I'm curious about, um, could you share a little bit more about that? Uh, I often say, pretend I know nothing. It's a Congress joke because we don't know everything. Um, uh, so that I can kind of look at that when uh, my team and I sit down because it sounds like a huge issue. So okay. I'll pass it to you first. In a minute. Thank you, those are great questions. Um, and I can speak a little bit about the testing issue um, and then I'll pass it down um, because I know Dr. Freeman is gonna be a a great person to talk about testing. Um, there are standards for testing for kids. Uh, Medicaid has standards of testing at 12 months, 24 months. Um, there are standards for testing for adults. Um, OSHA requires testing depending on what people's jobs are. Um, then there's also standards based on symptoms. And most kids don't have symptoms when they are lead exposed or affected. But sometimes kids will show up in a um, in an emergency room and the parent will say, uh, you know, I think they ate a piece of shot, a lead shot from lead sinker from fishing, or um, I found him with paint chips, chips all around his mouth. Um, and so sometimes things will present like that and people or the, uh, professionals will test kids because they think they have a high risk for that. Um, sometimes if parents learn something from you all or from another um, news organization, they may say, oh, I'm doing renovation on my house. Maybe I should get my kids tested, or I don't ever remember my kids getting tested, or something like that, and that'll prompt it, prompt the testing. In addition to, hopefully, in addition to, and not instead of the usual pattern of testing, um, we go back and forth with testing here um, in Kansas City, and we kind of encourage it in the metro because we're such a high risk area. We really encourage uh, families to get their kids tested every year because of the way kids um, move and families move uh, in the area and change their residence. And because of how they um, go to different daycares and, and different places where they could get exposed. Um, and then I'll pass this. I did bring some products if you want to see products. So, okay. Um, so, I'm going to go backwards. Um, the PSUs have a lot of resources and long lists of consumer goods that contain lead. Um, and I'm sure. Most health departments have a similar list, at least one or two, um, and and state health departments. So so so, I'd be happy to make those resources available if you want more detail. Um, I did want to mention one pathway of exposure that we haven't talked about, and then I'll get to your testing. That's the take home pathway of exposure. Um, and I'm sorry if that was coming in part two, but um, it seems relevant. So when parents work in industries that involve working with lead, uh, mechanics, battery recycling, battery making, um, making things for, for fishing, um, uh, shooting ranges, they will often be exposed to lead if they go home with their clothes, their boots, their coveralls, um, haven't worn the proper PPE, don't wash their hands necessarily, walk through the home, pick up their cute little baby that immediately puts their thing, the parent's finger in their mouths. You know, that's another pathway of exposure. And we actually, we see that um, not um, irregularly. Um, and then the first question was about the testing process, which I think you answered pretty well. Ultimately, most of these children are asymptomatic, um, meaning they don't have any symptoms. Usually that lead exposure comes a little bit over time, not eating the sinker um, or chewing on the windowsill, although that happens too. Um, and so 
Medicaid does have the rule 20, 12 and 24 months where we automatically give them a poke. Screening can also be a survey of questions and then the clinician can decide whether or not to poke because nobody likes to be poked. Um, Missouri has a set of guidances and it differs from other states where they've highlighted the high risk zip codes, mostly based on that lead belt mining and smelting areas um, and high rates of old, old homes with you know, old paint. Um, and so people who, for children who are in those zip codes are actually supposed to be screened annually till the age of six, which doesn't usually happen, but that is the recommendation. So it's, um, ages one and two is pretty universal at a national level. And then up to age six for certain areas. Um, and one and two is in part because there's a lot of that hand to mouth behavior um, and object to mouth behavior. So I think, I think I covered it. Thank you. Yeah, so to cover a little bit about the your question to the goods goods movement, I per se. Yeah, so you know, for example, the, the largest um port is in Los Angeles and Port of Long Beach, Port of Los Angeles, right? So a lot of our goods do come through that port. And however, I don't know if you've ever seen a package and they will also say they're certified by ARB, which is the California Air Resources Board. So they have a responsibility, right, to make sure that stuff coming into the to the US um, is is FDA approved, right? However, we know that, I mean, they have so many ships out there, so many containers, it's impossible to check every single cargo that comes through there, right? And so one of the approaches uh, in, in, that I've been involved in previously is looking at it from an intra-agency uh, approach, right? So it's not just the Air Resources Board, but it's the Department of Pesticides, it's the Department of Toxics, the Hazardous Substance Control, all these agencies coming together and really looking at what's coming across not just our, our oceans, but also our borders, right? And I can tell you that there have been incidents where they have stopped these trucks actually bringing stuff into the U.S. that are banned here, but they make it across, right? But it wouldn't happen if this interagency team was informed. So there's no way of doing this unless they say, okay, we're going to do this for six months or, or this for a weekend. That's the only time they'll catch that. So it's impossible to really identify all these things, but I think there ha there is that opportunity uh, where um, where our agencies can do more when it comes to the goods movement of, of anything, if anything coming into the US. And I'm not saying that there isn't things that are also manufactured here that can be harmful, right? But I think that one of them is really looking at those, that stuff they sell at the dollar stores is really comes, a lot of it comes from overseas, some, you know, some other country, and so it's, it's really making sure that we we um, we have that uh, that uh, um, enforcement and have that um, accountability, right? Hey, this is not going to make it. This, you know what? Send it back. Whatever you got to do, right? Find a polluter, whoever did that, whoever shipped it, and identify how to how to address those issues. Hope that was helpful. Thanks. And I'm Sam Horton. I'm the engagement uh, fellow with the Inferno Midwest Newsroom and Missouri Independent. So. I've been reporting for a few years, so it's just kind of an interesting role to take on investigative reporting. And as my friends joke with me now, they don't want me at their parties because I will tell them all about lead. And that's <laughs> definitely not something you want to talk about at a party. It kind of brings down the mood very quickly. So um, I'll just throw this in. We are getting questions over Zoom. So I'm going to keep my questions just to a few. I have a longer list, but I want to make sure our people who are attending getting asked their questions. So I'll just kind of keep it very short for my, my part. Um, so we're getting them over Zoom. So if you're on Zoom, just throw those questions in. And I have someone who's making sure to communicate this with me. And if you're here in attendance and have a question, just um, we'll, I'll ask a couple and then I'll just start going. Like I'll ask for a Zoom question. And if you want to raise your hand, and we'll kind of alternate between the Zoom questions and in person. So uh, with that, um, Elizabeth, I'm going to just start off real fast with like, how has the prevalence of lead poisoning changed over the decade? Just getting an idea of like, I know we talked about the CDC lowering its level, but what are we seeing with like, is this, we still keep hearing about this issue happening? Before I get my answer, I would like to invite um, Teresa Werman, who's 
probably zoomed in because she um, is a leader in the state led surveillance program for Missouri um, and also a wealth of information and just impressive overall. But my brief answer will be that it's really improved and decreased over the years, especially after lead was removed from gasoline. Um, one of the reasons it hasn't decreased as quickly, at least in this part, is because of all of those remnants of when we used it in the past, in the soil from gasoline, in the soil from industry, which is also present day, and then in our homes from really old lead paint. Um, the home I live in probably contains lead paint, and it was probably painted sometime before 1978. So, you know, it, lead is ubiquitous in our environment. Um, so that's why it, it's not going away, but, um, you know, I'm having a hard time visualizing the graph with the numbers on it. But after 1970, when lead gas was removed, <laughs> when lead was removed from gasoline, we saw a huge drop in blood lead levels in children. And that was a very um, impactful way that Congress was able to um, advocate for the health of children throughout the nation. Um, but I, I do want to invite our public healthers um, to, to maybe even give a better answer and a more localized answer. Um, thank you. And if uh, Teresa jumps in, um, just I'm here if you have a question, yes. So. <laughs> <laughs> Want to comment? I can if you'd like. Okay. I think uh, one of the greatest uh, success stories that we see in public health is to look at a graph of lead poisoning of children starting in the 1970s, which was probably my time when I would have been lead poisoned as a child, um, to when, where we are today. And you will see a dramatic decrease over time. And most of those decreases coincide with the public health action, including uh, legislation to remove lead paint in 1978 and lead gasoline in 1996. Those are the biggest hallmarks of when we see a significant drop in lead levels. But we have seen a de continual decline even through today, um, even across the state of Missouri, our levels run just a little bit higher than the national average, but we do continue to see the same trend lines uh, across the state, so that we see across the nation. It really is quite um, remarkable if you want to see how public health works. Awesome. Um, I, I don't have much to add um, in other than as we see um, improvements in lead levels and, you know, kids who used to, the majority of kids would be, you know, back in the day, they thought that if you didn't die from lead poisoning, you were going to be okay. So you either lived or you died. And if you lived, you were good. Um, but as we see those decreases, um, we also see research that's showing um, continued effects. So that's what's keeping us moving forward with, um, with our work to, to eliminate lead poisoning. Thank you. And so, Ganga, I was hoping you could talk a little about what a natural amount of lead in soil is and tie that to your research about then what you're working on and what you're hoping to see accomplished with your research, maybe going to the future after you're able to study uh, long-term effects. Yeah. So, um, I think I mentioned about the uh, what we consider as average or like a background in concentration. So it's about like 15 to 35 uh, ppm, depending on where we looked at. And then the uh, my research work uh, recently started, uh, funded by HUD. The current research work recently started, funded by HUD. Actually, I'm proud to say that uh, two co PIs are sitting. Uh, left and right to me for that. So the, the effort is to uh, try to see that the amending soils with uh, things like such as phosphorus and some other sources proven to be effective in reducing uh, bioavailability of soil lead and then monitoring those for about three years to see the reductions and trying to understand why those reductions happening. And then eventually, so the small scale, uh, the, the, the maybe about 10 to 12 vacant lot sites and about 10 to 12 
the residential sites, um, having those treated and monitoring and then looking at effectiveness and then the, the ultimately to upscale it, look at opportunities to upscale it and do maybe uh, collaborating with, uh, we are collaborating with City of Kansas uh, City as well, then maybe looking at opportunities to upscale it and working on larger areas. So uh, th that's what the expectations are. So we know that it's working, but can we practically do it? And then can we actually benefit the lead mitigation programs like Amy is working on? And then just, just a quick follow-up so that I know the UK has a 400 parts per million, uh, that's the action level. So I guess, you know, and I know a conversation about like, it, will that reduce down to 200 or, you know, is that something that hasn't been adjusted for a few years? And do you see then your, what your research is doing to help maybe address some of that? Because there's, if you look at numbers of properties, you can see easily how much more, how many more properties might qualify for some form of remediation. So committing about those concentrations, so we are doing, we have been doing like a lot of screening in Kansas City area, Kansas City, Missouri area. So the lead concentrations, if you ask me like a site, is it 400, is it like above 400 or below 400? The thing is the lead is highly, the lead distribution is highly heterogeneous. So most of the sites, it could be that the range could be 35 to maybe 800, 35 or less than 35 to maybe all the way up to uh, 400. So likewise, it's a wide range. So it's not evenly distributed. So it's another challenge that we have to uh, face. And then the, the soil treatments, for example, could work very effectively when you have high, uh, the uh, more elevation, like high elevated, but the challenge is how can you get it to work when you have mild elevation? So uh, that's a, re a re reason for our research. So the EPA, the number, and then what it should be. Um, I think EPA understand the, the 400 need to be revisited. And uh, as we speak, I'm sure they are working on it. But at the same time, um, I think the concerns are that the, the burden that comes with it, I think that that that's might be the, the part of the reason of the delay before the delay. But, but, but I do think that the 400 came when we had children's blood lead concentration, like action level, when it was 10 micrograms per deciliter. So it came down to in 2012 to five and then uh, even before that, I think, so it came down to uh, 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 five micrograms per deciliter in 2012 and 2021 to 3.5. So I think it's high time to revisit that number. Thank you. And I have one, um, one more question and then I'm gonna start putting in uh, questions from Zoom and, and our audience. So I will make this quick here. Um, Beto, could you talk, could you give an environmental justice perspective when it comes to lead and where people of color live and who's like, who's most uh, impacted by lead exposure and how it disproportionately affects some communities? I know that's a lot and I'm just asking you to unpack it, but I'm hoping you can talk about it a little bit. Yeah, so, you know, one of the ways, one of the ways that the communities of color, uh, you know, you heard Sharice Davis say that, why that is one of those census tracks that qualifies for a lot of investment, right? And so looking at it from what state local, right? So looking at it from that lens is really identifying not just the, you know, we talked already talked about the, the water pipe, the paints, but fence line industries, right? Meaning that they're in close proximity within a few feet or it could be a mile. And so what you know, a lot of our work, like I said earlier, started in Argentina and Armadale. That's our organization started as a neighborhood group, concerns around industrial pollution, water pollution, air pollution, everything, right? So uh, one of the things that we've noticed in the community and a lot of concerns is that you know, there's a history also of legacy contamination from previous floods back in the, I think I've heard uh, historically back to like in the 60s or the late 50s, 60s, right? So there's a lot of concerns in this community about also the, the soil 
the legacy contamination in the soil. And uh, not to mention like the, the industries that are emitting uh, toxic pollution, including lead, which are, aren't regulated. You know, we don't have a proper uh, lead monitoring system that, that tells you how many emissions are in the air. You know, there's one monitor in, in Nebraska Avenue uh, here in uh, down the street on Minnesota and in, uh, in Nebraska. You know, but that's not reflective of what's happening in the local community. And they live fence line to the dismantlers, right? All of the dismantlers, which you talk about gasoline, even though they're not, maybe gasoline was, uh, was banned back in the 70s. I mean, the um, lead, it, um, it's, it, that, that has an impact in the local neighborhood. You know, we've taken samples from the soil and send them to a lab so they can test them because community members are concerned when there's a, a stormwater, a, a, a rain event, uh, they notice this odor, but they're also very concerned about how they can grow food in their own, in their own um, in gardens, right? So they know that they can't just rely on that soil. They have to, you know what? We need to bring soil from elsewhere, right? To make sure our, 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 our garden thrives and all that. But also, who are the people that ingest that? If you don't have a proper garden, you're just growing stuff. You know, kids usually sometimes, you know, kids are always playing in the grass too, you know? And so one of the things I want to share is, you know, there's a lot of, like I said earlier, a lot of Superfund sites that have been cleaned up to some minimal standard, not a standard that's going to protect public health, just minimal, just the bare minimum, which, you know, that's a lack of, of you know, a lack of responsibility on behalf of the agencies that are supposed to protect public health because, you know, they cite with the polluter, they cite, they have their own uh, remediation company that helps them move forward quickly and say, hey, this is what we want to do. And if the community is not involved and informed the right way, guess what? They are the ones that are going to be impacted and continue being burdened by that. Because then what happens is that the government, the federal government, the like HUD, the housing, has intentionally put people of color near these sites that are contaminated because of practices, policies, and programs, right, that are racist in those institutions. They say, you know what? We have this funding, but, you know, we have this plot of land that it's cheap, it's contaminated. Guess what? If we could put some low income housing there, let's put these people there. Let's put this community there because you know what? They're not going to push back because they're already struggling. And so, really, need to look at that holistically, you know, what that means when it comes to those practices within our local agencies and, and the government, right? So, um, that's just one, one example of how they're not just clustered with paint in their home, they're clustered with the water, so, uh, the soil and the water and the air right around them that they're breathing this stuff. So um, hopefully that answered your question. Yeah, I appreciate your insight on that. I really do. And so I'm gonna jump over to start some of the Zoom call or Zoom questions here, but I'll, I'll go ahead and ask one and if anyone in the audience has a question they wanna raise their hand, we can pass the mic to you then afterwards or you can come up to the front here, maybe it might work better just so we don't have to go too far, but. Um, this question is from Ann Knoll. Uh, she's, she says, I worked in the first lead evaluation program at St. Louis County Department of Health from 1979 to 1981. We were testing all Head Start children. Sources were lead paint and soil with the then lead gasoline falling along interstates and automobile manufacturing paint booths. And the question is, what now in Kansas City is the major source of lead poisoning in children? Thanks, that's a good question. Um, the major source of lead poisoning in kids in Kansas City is residential housing and the primary residence of the child. And that's pretty much the cause of lead poisoning throughout. And then these other sources just add to that burden that the child already has. Um, so um, I think that's awesome that, that she has a history of uh, working in the first, or one of the, one of the earlier programs um, in terms of testing at Head Starts. There are a lot of different agencies that do test at Head Starts. Um, Kansas City is one of them, but with um, challenges from the pandemic um, has made it uh, difficult for us to kind of move forward with some of those, um, some of that normal testing. Hopefully now that people are starting to come back and get their healthcare and go back to school, we'll be seeing um, improvements in that testing. Um. Elizabeth, I'll ask you this question from 
Stephanie Kirchelo. I'm so sorry if I mispronounced anybody's name that's some in questions, but what kind of education is being done to get the message out that lead screening is lab testing, not a questionnaire? Is it commercials or radio ads? That lead screening is lab test. That, sorry. What, what kind of education is being to get the message out that lead screening is lab testing and not just a questionnaire? Oh. So I'm going to presume that that is education for clinicians and health care providers and public healthers. Um, to be perfectly honest, I think most of us, <laughs> I think most of us go straight for the poke. Um, the questionnaires are provided by states often, um, at least every state I've worked in. And um, Often the surveys are completed, um, and perhaps it's you know uh, my bias based on working in Medicaid with Medicaid populations primarily, but because they're required to actually have a capillary copay one and two, that's that's become at least the standard where I'm working. Um, so, and I and I can. I would say that, that since my training, and I realize that, that that's anecdotal, um, but since the beginning of my training, I would say we've pretty consistently done the capillary poke at H1 and 2, regardless of insurance. Um, so I guess there are a few other points I could make. Not in every state, but in some states, Medicaid is directly involved. And if a child doesn't receive that capillary poke by their first and second birthday, then the healthcare providers will not be reimbursed. So that's a form of education. Um, and it's usually the managers that direct us to <laughs> recalibrate our, our practice. Um, and I don't, nothing else is really coming to mind about you, Amy. Um, yeah, I mean, we kind of, uh, we kind of have a, a similar issues most of the time. We always recommend the poke. I think there are some practitioners, I think, get pushed back from families, especially if the child has to have multiple vaccinations. Um, people are more afraid of diseases like measles and polio than they are maybe of lead poisoning. And so if their child has to have four shots, um, having a finger stick is one, just one more that if they can avoid it, they sometimes will try that. Um, I have seen some confusion as to what lead screening is and the definition of that. And some um, pr practitioners will say, oh, well, screening is the questionnaire. No, screening is the poke and kind of go back and forth uh, with that a little bit. So there is a, a little bit of confusion that we know kind of that way. Um, we do recommend the poke because poke is the poke. And um, the screening questionnaire, as with all questionnaires, has various um, challenges and various, you know, possible biases and things like that. And, and sometimes parents just want to give you the answer that they think you want to hear. Um, so, and sometimes um, parents just want to get done and get out of their physician's office. Too, so. Does anyone in the audience have any questions? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't think I do. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm just curious uh, if there's a way to quantify the number of kids that are currently being affected by lead poisoning in the metro or in the area? And how does a parent know if their kid is affected by it? Well, I can tell you about Kansas City. I, I'm not quite loud enough. Um, so Kansas City, um, we have around 1,500 kids at, at any given time, depending um, who are lead poisoned or who are impacted. Um, and these are, this is kids that are um, six or under. Um, we do have some older kids that we're seeing kids older and older um, sort of hang on to those lead levels. And so that's, we really want to start reaching even those older kids, seven, eight, and nine, that normally um, aren't followed because they're kind of out of that highest risk age range. Um, in terms of the metro, um, I can't speak as well to the metro, but I can tell you Kansas City, around 1,500. Um, and parents, sometimes have an idea um, if their kids have been exposed because they may know from their own upbringing or from the media. Um, 
oh, you know, if you're doing renovation or if you live in an old house or if um, you find your child with paint chips, although I, that usually is not how kids really get lead poisoned, um, although it is something that parents will look at for those paint chips. Most kids get lead poisoned from things that they, that pick up dust off the ground. And but what are the symptoms? Well, the problem with symptoms and lead poisoning, and I'll give this to um, Dr. Friedman as well, is that lead poisoning symptoms mimic a lot of other things. So it can look kind of like flu, you know, like maybe they have uh, stomach upset, maybe they have irritability, maybe they have fatigue, maybe they have constipation, weakness in the hands and, and ankles, um, speech delay. Um, sometimes you'll see uh, kids aren't, they'll be off their food, um, but that can mimic so many different things and it can just mimic your regular, just ups and downs of regular growing. And that's one of the reasons why we have standardized testing to, to help make sure that those kids are caught and, and we don't look for symptoms. So, um, you know, if symptoms, if we're really looking for symptoms, I would say a serious regression um, or, um, you know, probably something like that. Would you treat it? We can treat it. And I'll pass it to Dr. Friedman to talk about treatment. So like Amy said, most, most children who've been lead poisoned are not going to have symptoms at all. Um, and the ones that have had severe poisoning, especially if it's acute, like suddenly from eating a big chunk of something that contains lead as opposed to, you know, uh, as opposed to being in a home that has a lot of lead paint dust and that building up over time, both of them can get to high exposure levels. Um, but the that acute exposure, that large dose at once, probably is more likely to be symptomatic. Um, if someone has really high levels, we may see uh, we see constipation is a big one, tummy aches, um, really high. We may see some neurologic adverse effects, symptom with symptoms, but for the most case, for the most part, we really don't. Um, and I was thinking about what you were saying, Amy. Um, we may see kids with certain behaviors, like pica, um, eating non-food substances, putting things in their mouths. Um, you know, that's not an outcome, but it is a common cause. So if we see someone with those risk factors, those types of behaviors that may lead to additional testing. Um, so again, that's why we, we poke, because we don't usually see symptoms, and that's the age where everything goes, <laughs> everything goes in the mouth um, at ages one and two. So that was the first question, right? Yeah, I think that covered. We'll just go back because I want to okay. make sure we get every, or get all the questions. So I'll keep in. If people have follow-ups, we'll just connect and try to make sure. Okay. Yeah, you're good. <laughs> Thanks. Um, okay. And so, go to my thing on fast. Um, from, uh, from, from Senator Jill Shoup, um, I guess, just wondering, how do we learn about and protect ourselves from products with lead in them and all? But um, I don't think, would you mind just maybe you want to talk about, like, at least from a consumer, like, from your, like, with the research and work that you do, at least for, on the grassroots side of this, how you inform people to be aware? Well, uh, it's an interesting question because, you know, I, I think a lot of us, would know not to buy these products, right? <laughs> so it's kind of like a trick question, I think, because I think, you know, in, in the role of a senator, so? yeah, yes, so, yes, yes. so I think that, you know, looking at it from the, the perspective is like, I would assume that you know how to protect yourself, right? And we know how to protect ourselves, but not all, not all kids or families know about the impacts, right, of lead, whether it's the consumer goods or, you know, I think consumer goods primarily because I think there is enough education around around the kids being, in, you know, having a high uh, or having um, high elevated levels through the uh, hospitals and, and, and these spaces. So I think that there has to be some more education on that. I think that might be something worth thinking about. You know, how is it that we really target um, that was the audiences, right? That go to these stores through the TV, maybe, and just say, "Hey, be careful with these toxic chemicals that are also can contribute to a higher uh, 
levels of, of lead, right? And so I think there needs to be like an educational campaign maybe around that because yeah, I, I don't I don't think I have the best answer for this one because I think that most of us know not to, you know, we're not gonna eat those, you know. So it's kind of like a like a trick question. It was a trick question for me. So um, but maybe you can answer. Um, so I think a lot, unfortunately, a lot of this education comes retroactively. When we find a child who's been exposed, that's when we'll sit down and spend more than a fraction of a minute specifically talking about lead exposure, identifying the source through a home assessment or an exposure assessment where we say, do you use any of these products? Do you have any of these things in your home? Does your kid eat imported candy? Um, you know, there are certain there are certain popular products that we can know to ask. Um, and I know um, in Amy's experience doing home assessments, we've seen like religious powders um, and herbs. So uh, unfortunately, it's retroactive, but that's been an effective way to remove the source so that it doesn't continue to poison the child. I wanted to add another example real quick. So one example that I've seen recently is uh, there was an approval of an electric um, battery facility um, announced by the legislature, I think, the governor. Uh, but the, it was it's supposed to be housed at a former ammunition facility, right? So when we think about lead and we think about ammo, we think about that, you know, that's really, you know, really in a community that is kind of growing, but the population is not that, you know, wealthy. And so again, it's targeted. I want to show that example when it comes to the education. Like we know this. Why would our governor give a tax incentive to allow people to work in a facility that has historical lead? contamination in it. It was shut down because of that, but now, because now a zero emissions and the battery sounds really good, let's get this, let's give this company incentives, but guess what? It's gonna harm them because they're going into a place that was previously not designated as super fun, but they know of the historical issues there and nobody else ever wanted to manufacture anything there. But now, you know, so that's just another example of there's a way to, to continue that education, but I feel like sometimes our decision makers look the other way, right? Because they say, oh, there's an opportunity for more jobs, but is this job safe for the worker? No, it's not going to be safe when they're going to have to be exposed to a, in a facility that, ha that has a, um, that previously uh, manufactured um, uh, weapons and all that stuff, you know, so. I have about three more questions and final comments. So I know we're going a little bit here to finish it all up. I just want to try to get a chance for everyone to get a question in. And if, there, if there's any that we don't get to, I'll work on follow-up for those folks. So on Zoom or however um, you are able to get in touch with you. Um, a question from Cynthia Gardner is, how risky is China, is yeah, China and dinnerware? And what about drinking from lead crystal? Uh, Amy, I'll let you, I know you, you actually brought some ceramic stuff as well, so I'll let you talk about this. Thank you. Um, so what we say with China, you can get your dishes tested at, at different places. So there's swabs that you can buy. You can buy these little lead check swabs. You can get them at big box stores or a hardware store, and you can check them yourself. Um, it, in at the our health department, Kansas City, Missouri, you can make an appointment and bring your dishes in and we will check them for you with our machine. It's not destructive. We just um, check it with our XRF, which is like our, our ray gun. Um, and then we can make some recommendations for you. But normally we say if it's chipped or cracked or crazed, which is a bunch of little bitty cracks, then you just need to get rid of it or keep it as decoration. Um, you shouldn't store anything in lead crystal. I mean, if an adult wants to use crystal champagne, champagne goblets um, at their anniversary or at their wedding, um, use it, drink it, and then wash it. So um, that really is going to decrease the absorption that you might have. So keep it for special occasions. Kids should never drink out of lead crystal or anything that's high risk, which is um, homemade pottery, um, pottery that's fired at low temperatures. Um, I would also be careful with traditional pottery. Um, if it's traditional 
Chinese pottery or um, pottery from India or, um, or Mexico. Um, or we, one of the things we look for is a sticker that says Prop 65. So Proposition 65 is a California law that looks at um, lead and cadmium hazards in products. So if you see the little sticker on that, um, then you wanna make sure that it's kept out of the reach of kids and pets. I have a soil question here. So I'm gonna ask you about it a little bit, but lead in soil in Kansas, is there a transfer to crops? We, I guess, when we look at food sources, if you could talk a little about that. So the one positive thing about soil lead is the inability to move from soil to plant. And then that, that's a good thing. Like I said before, the one reason why lead persistent in soil, that is because most soil particles could absorb, hang on to lead and not let it go. So that characteristic make, it is very hard for lead to move from soil to plant. But if you do have lead ele elevation, that you would see that little bit accumulation, little bit more accumulation in root crops, but you would not see that lead moving from root to shoot. So if you do have lead contamination, the, my advice is don't grow root crops. Don't take a risk. It may not be like if you're consuming that like once in a while, it may not be like problematic, but you can avoid it. If you want to minimize any exposure to your children, you can avoid that. And then uh, we, we, we have conducted, actually at Kansas State, about seven year study uh, funded through EPA Brownfields program where we looked at this problem, where we grow crops in, uh, and directly in soils, contaminated with lead and looking at lead uptake. And, and not just in Kansas City, but nationwide. And we have seen that repeatedly, that same trend. Food crops tend to accumulate, but you don't see that in leafy vegetables, or you don't see that with the, the fruity crops like tomatoes and things like that. So the, the, the main issue is direct contamination to contaminated soils, not washing your uh, produce properly. So having low growing leafy vegetables contaminated with uh, soil. So consuming those can actually increase, uh, enhance the, the, uh, uh, the exposure, but not directly like in plant bacteria. Thank you. I'm learning so much. I mean, I thought that I've been studying, like learning about this for you know, six months and I'm still learning so much just tonight. Um, one last question and we'll do final comments here at the end here, but um, this is actually from one of my former colleagues, uh, Justin Hicks, but he's, um, he thanks us for our work and reporting and hosting the conversation, but he wants to ask y'all a little bit to help understand what, limit, what, um, what the limitations are to making lead tests accessible to anyone at home. Like, I guess he's wondering if, you know, he feels like maybe everyone, is a sign that everyone should have a basic right and have a right to ask and know for free or at least for low, a low cost and um, what's in their soil or water or air or you know even consumer goods. And so it, but the question I guess about that cost barrier that might exist. <laughs> I think um, uh, they're exactly right. There is a big cost barrier in, to testing. Um, there are some programs, again, like I said earlier, that have fixed resources and some that don't. And some have jurisdictions that they can't provide them outside of their of uh, their area. Um, we have free um, test kits that we can give people so they can do a um, test the their um, housing components, like if they want to do a dust wipe test. Um, and then we have product testing, but people have to come in. You know, we can't go to their house. Um, I think it's definitely a challenge making these available to everyone and making them free. Um, for example, our dust web kits cost $15. They're free. We give them to people, but we are the ones that pay that $15. Um, and so that's pretty expensive. Um, and then I know there's, we do get requests a lot of times from um, adults and for their kids and for themselves to get blood blood testing. And I know that a lot of times insurance will accept test results and they'll pay for for testing for um, some ages and some reasons, but not all of them. Um, and especially with kids having to be, um, 
have uh, be re-signed up for Medicaid every year now. They kind of fall between those cracks. So um, those products and that, that can help people, I think it's definitely an, an issue. Uh, I think that question lends itself well to a bigger conversation with some of our federal partners. Um, as a lifelong renter, usually when I move into a place, uh, although I don't know that it happened when I moved into my current rental, I would get a little pamphlet that says, your home may contain wet. That was it. Um, so, you know, for people who are buying homes, I know that these types of assessments are available at a cost. Um, and I know that HUD does have certain protective programs um, for children living in subsidized housing. Um, usually once the child has been identified. Um, so, you know, I don't have a great answer, but I do think I do think that this is something that our rulemakers have been thinking about. Um, and just thought I'd throw that part out there again. Related to soil testing, um, soil testing can be done for a reasonable price through uh, state universities, through their extension programs. And many states uh, do that. And then the costs can be varied. Um, cost can be for multiple uh, potentially toxic uh, metals. It could be ten to twenty dollars, for example. Thank you. I'm not sure if all the emails maybe provide some resources to people yes. so they have an idea of what's out there in the community that can help you all know what um, the source. Yeah, we're last. We're doing final comments and we're and we're going to be heading out here. So I just wonder for all of you, we'll just go down the, the line here a little bit of just talking about, you know, what do you, what do you maybe hope to see improve when it comes to, I know there's, you mentioned this has been a public health success and there's been improvements. Those are, I guess, what work do you see still need to be done when it comes to lead exposure and lead poisoning? Thank you. Um, I think one of the biggest things for us would be improvements in housing because when we improve people's housing, when we look at their lead hazards and make those improvements, um, it has multiple effects. So it also improves their energy efficiency. It improves the life of their house. Um, it makes it more sustainable. It helps get rid of a lot of other, what we call healthy home hazards. So fixing for lead, um, even if we aren't specifically addressing other hazards in the home, just is a byproduct um, of, of the repairs that we do for lead paint. Um, there aren't a lot of resources in the area. Um, Iowa has quite a few HUD grants that are available. Um, I know Nebraska has a few, Kansas City, Missouri, St. Louis County and City, um, Wyandotte County, Wichita and St. Joe also are um, areas that have resources to provide um, free and low cost lead hazard repair for families with young kids. Yeah, I think uh, to comment on that question, the probably uh, coming together like uh, various disciplines, the, the healthcare providers, and then the programs like Amy's, and then the the right now what we are trying to do with our research project, we are soil scientists or not just soil scientists, the other uh, scientists as well. I think coming together and trying to address like any other environmental issue, it's not something that one person can or one discipline can solve. So I think that the, the interdisciplinary co collaboration and try everything possible to minimize these pathways, I think that would be something that I would like to see happening. This is our final comment. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think I know what Vinto's going to say, so I'm not going to say that one. Um, the primary treatment for a poisoning, an exposure of concern, is to remove the exposure. Not to test for it and then remove it, but to just eliminate the risk of exposure. So I think, which we're all working on in various ways, that's that's the number one. But I'm, I'm going to... Um, I'm gonna pull a bit here and I wanna add something that doesn't answer your question at all, which is, um, 
you know, in listening to a lot of your stories and listening to the, the, the reports that come out of Michigan and, you know, other places, you know, I think it's appropriate that we be nervous and it's appropriate that we educate the public, but I think that we're forgetting to remind parents that there are things that we can do. You can't, you can't go back, you know, it's not reversible, whatever Lynn has done, but we can mitigate risk. We can make sure that kids have a bedtime story every night, that they have a safe place to explore, to sleep, that they feel safe in their homes, that they're in, in enriching, um, that they have enriching learning experiences, which is not in front of a tablet or a TV. And um, I just, I wanted to make sure that I said that tonight. So I know that wasn't your question, but I, I think we need to remind our parents that while, yeah, it's not fair, and yeah, this happened, and we need to take some steps to, to do our best to fix the problem to the best of our ability, we can mitigate risk. Um, and I think it's really important to give people something that they can do, not just all the negativism. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so I heard the word interdisciplinary, and a lot of us here, right, working to advance community, community, right, advance protections for our community. And one thing that I would highly recommend is and hopefully this is what I was thinking that community-led research where community members are involved, is that it? No, uh, involved in some of that processes, right? You know, I, I heard you mention about the plants that are succulent, you know, um, my partner said, sometimes tells me, can you pick up some uh, cactus or nopales, right? We did a perchlorid study um, a, a while back and we identified, you know, cactus is one of those plants that just pulls that water, right? And we tested it and it came back high for lead and other metals, right? But our familias, people of color, Mexicanos, Hispanos, Chicanos, Latinos, Indigenous, uh, I, I mean, there's more, but I, you know, um, are, these are stuff that is native to us, right? That's native to us that we grow with, right? So if we grow this stuff in our own backyards on regular soil, which is already contaminated, you know, there's all those other impacts, right? So I think always thinking about how the community can be involved in that research process, right? Because I can tell you that community members here locally do not trust the local government, right? They don't trust them and that's a barrier and to improve health. And once we can get past that, then you know what? They can be a lot more improved because then people want to participate, but we need to be inclusive of how we make sure they participate in that decision-making, guiding the research project where there's a, CBPR project, NIHS funded project, that they're part of that decision making all the way, because then that's how we're going to be able to move forward and not be dealing with this. Oh, how do we move forward? How do we do this? No, we need to really include the community in the design of a research project. Thank you. Do you want to add what you know? Yeah, thank you. Then we're going to finish yeah. it up. I mean, it's simple enforcement. There are rules and regs and they differ from county to county and city to city and state to state, which is really confusing. Um, but, and enforcement alone isn't gonna fix the problem, but what I'm seeing in working with our medical legal clinic um, and communicating with the one at Washington University in St. Louis as well, is that there are some things that um, we could do um, that are supported by law. And I think it's just so cumbersome and very confusing. Um, and there are so many different layers from federal, state to county to um, that that makes it really challenging. Um, but I'm starting to see I'm starting to see groups working together to to address that specific uh, variable. So that was the other one I was thinking. Thank you so much. And thank you for bringing up about as well as some of the you know ways that caregivers and parents can take action because I mean it was something on my list that we had to get into. So I'm glad you mentioned something. Um, I want to thank all our panelists this evening for being here and joining us. I hope everyone can have a safe ride home. And I mean, I'm guessing they might be down a little bit. So if you have questions, hopefully we can ask them. Thanks to our Zoomers. I also want to, to acknowledge the Kansas City Kansas Public Library and our new friend, new best friend, Laura Loveless over there. A great venue for, um, and so much support for helping us. I recommend if you're going to do an event, this is the place, free parking. 
Um, we have a slot of food that we brought because we thought that would be like an enticement. Um, please eat some, but if you also know a community that could be eating that tonight and you want to take a tray with you, I'm totally open to that. Um, and of course, water, who doesn't want non-leaded water, right, to drink um, on, on, um, at home. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Don't forget to bring, take your little swag bags. Those are your thank you gifts. I know you're all members and donate already to KCUR, but if not, there's information in there that can help you. So thank you, and thank you again to the Missouri Independent. Really appreciate it. Thanks.